welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility, and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games, and more people to see themselves in the games they play? Toward the end of last week, Sony had a brand new State of Play presentation, focused almost exclusively on upcoming PS5 exclusive Ratchet and Clank. Rift apart. Releasing at the start of next month, Rift Apart is a third-person platformer where players can pull themselves through rifts to teleport around levels at high speed, making use of the console's new ultra-fast SSD. While most of the presentation was focused on new features coming to the game that are not necessarily focused on disabled gamers, towards the end of the presentation there was a short but very dense sizzle reel of accessibility content shown. Now, that says a reel was way too fast for anyone watching in real time to understand any of the accessibility features coming to the game, but people who decided to, like me, freeze frame that trailer and go through frame by frame, were able to learn a lot about the accessibility features coming to Ratchet and Clank when it releases at the start of next month. So today, on Access Ability, we're going to be talking about the accessibility features that we're currently aware of that will be coming to Ratchet and Clank Rift apart. when it releases at the start of next month. We're going to talk about the positives of some of those accessibility features. We're going to talk about how this fits into Sony's overall plan for accessibility going forward. And we're going to talk about the fact that, while it's great that we know these accessibility features, the way that they were communicated to players was really not ideal. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart features in its settings menu a dedicated accessibility menu, but some of the game's accessibility settings are also placed into more generalised setting submenus, likely as a way to get them in front of players who may not feel comfortable with the fact that these settings are labelled as accessibility. In the Heads Up Display HUD settings menu, players can decide if waypoints appear when a button is pressed, or at all times, change whether the game displays on-screen prompts when rift tethers are possible, alter icon and button prompt sizes, turn off UI parallax effects, turn on a centre screen dot that's always visible outside of cutscenes, as well as change the colour of UI elements, such as what colour important words and text are highlighted. For players who may have trouble engaging with excessive rumble or adaptive trigger usage, the haptic settings menu allows vibration and adaptive triggers to have their prominence altered. For vibration, the default is called experiential, and features vibrations for everything from footsteps to rain falling. You can change this to a setting called functional, which will instead only include vibrations which are useful for gameplay, such as vibrating when you've taken damage or picked up ammo successfully. The adaptive triggers also feature experiential and functional modes, but exactly what this changes was not made clear. You can also in-game turn down the overall strength of those rumble effects, independently of altering how many rumble effects happen. Moving over to the game's dedicated accessibility menu, options are split into three sub-menus. Gameplay and camera, toggles and assists, and visual and contrast options. Gameplay and camera includes options for simplified traversal, where all traversal types are mapped to the same single button, as well as sliders for camera sensitivity and camera shake levels. The Toggles and Assists menu includes a bunch of settings designed to turn buttonholds into toggles, as well as aim assist intensity and auto aim intensity settings. There's also flight assist options, the ability to set off screen ledge guarding, hover boot auto pump, and the ability to change swing mode from a held button to a toggle. In the Visual and Contrast menu, players can set the previously mentioned centre screen dot, as well as altering a motion blur slider, tweaking depth of field, turning off chromatic aberration, decreasing film grain, turning off full screen effects, and turning off camera shake. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, High Contrast Mode is back. Previously seen in The Last of Us 2 and Spider-Man Miles Morales, this mode allows players to highlight the player character, enemies, boss enemies, hazards, collectibles, and more in bright colours which are easier to pick out and identify for players with various degrees of blindness. This has somewhat become a staple of Sony first party studio design and is a great feature to see return in Rift Apart. All of the accessibility settings we currently know about for Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. are undoubtedly positives, they are moving this series forward compared to past entries, 
and it's great to see that Sony was acknowledging these and trying to make them standards going forward for a lot of their first party games, or at least that seems to be the way if we look at The Last of Us 2, Miles Morales. Rift apart. The problem is that while it's great that these settings were acknowledged during Stage of Play, we should really be expecting better from Sony because we shouldn't have to freeze frame to find out what accessibility settings are available, and I think Sony needs to improve on that. As I briefly mentioned at the top of this video, these accessibility settings were revealed toward the end of a 15 minute gameplay reveal for Rift Apart, in a very short sizzle reel. Where non-accessibility gameplay features, such as the new wall run and dash mechanics, were given time and space to be properly shown off, all of the game's accessibility settings were rushed through so fast that I had to freeze frame to learn what options the game would have for disabled players. The State of Play presentation featured an announcer stating that more information on accessibility would come at a later date, but I really don't see why accessibility was handled that way. Disabled players should not have had to do frame by frame analysis to learn out if they were going to be able to play this game or not. Last week on Accessibility, we talked in detail about the importance of not treating accessibility features as secrets held needlessly until closer to launch or hidden from easy player discovery. If this presentation had instead had the announcer say something like, if you visit the PlayStation Twitter account following this presentation, you can find a link to an article detailing our accessibility settings. That would have made this information a lot easier to access. Sony has done this before. They released an in-depth article prior to the release of The Last of Us 2, detailing the game's accessibility settings, and I wish that we'd seen the same happen here, rather than the only information given being incomplete and pieced together from paused frames. The information was there, it just could have been more transparently communicated. Looking at all of the accessibility settings we know about for Ratchet and Clank, Rift apart. I think that this game is showing a reasonably positive level of accessibility. Particularly for partially sighted players or players with motor control disabilities, players who have motion sickness issues, players who can't hold down buttons for long periods of time, players that need high contrast mode in order to be able to pick out what's happening on screen. There is a good variety of settings that make me feel very positive about the direction that Sony is moving in terms of software level accessibility for their first party titles. There may be more accessibility settings in Ratchet and Clank that I'm not currently aware of because I was screen capping freeze frames of a trailer that was kind of cutting away from menus a little early, but if we take at face value that these are the accessibility settings in the final game, then Rift Apart should have comparable accessibility settings to something like Spider-Man Miles Morales, which, you know, that's not quite up to the level of The Last of Us 2 for example, but it is still miles ahead of the first party software from Microsoft and Nintendo. Even if it's not reaching the peak of what Sony has done with some first party titles, it is still a wonderful degree of accessibility worthy of praise. While I wish that accessibility information for Rift Apart had been more accessible to disabled players, the information that we have suggests that this game is going to be fairly accessible for a pretty wide range of disabled gamers, and I mean, it's tough to ask for more than that. This seems like it's going to be fairly accessible, and that's exciting considering how good this game looks.